Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm a YouTube newbie. Welcome to the Late Lockdown List, where I talk about things that have been on my mind since the lockdown started, and some even before. I'm trying out something new today, so instead of seeing just me for the entire video, you'll be seeing a fixed end version of me. That's the character I kind of drew. Anyway, for those of you who have been here before, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, welcome to the third episode of a series on series where we're talking about Nalini Singh's other supernatural paranormal series called Guild Hunter. Since the series has been out for quite some time, if you haven't read it and are sensitive to spoilers, well, I talk about certain details. However, I'm going to tell you if there are particularly crucial plot points that I'll talk about. You hear this Spoilers. when I'm about to spoil something, and this when it ends. First off, what is the Guild Hunter series about? We start with a question. How are vampires made or turned? From a bite, right? You're thinking Dracula, uh, Buffy, Angel, maybe even Twilight. But in this series, vampires aren't made by angels. That's right, the winged creatures. The series starts out with one particular guild hunter, Elena Devereaux. I'm not going to spoil the story by telling you exactly what happens to her. I am, however, going to tell you that in this series, of which there are 13 books and 4 novellas, you have vampires who work for angels for 100 years to serve out their contract and in turn, there are angels who work for archangels who make up the cadre of ten who effectively rule the world. The Guild Hunter series begins with, in earnest with the first book, Angel's Blood, with Guild Hunter Elena Devereaux and the Archangel of New York, Raphael. No last name. We first meet Elena at work, tracking down a runaway vampire. The Guild Hunters are humans, mostly. Uh, although some are hunter-born like Elena, who are gifted with an almost preternatural sense of smell so that they can track vampires. At the end of the track, um, she finds the baby vamp, a newly turned vampire, and returns him to his master, an angel. Said angel tells Elena that she has a new assignment, which terrifies her, New York. Apparently, when an angel says New York, it can only mean one thing, the Archangel Raphael who rules North America. Raphael has a mission for Elena to hunt down the blood-born Archangel Ura. It reads a little like a detective story, chasing down a bad guy who's way more powerful and centuries, maybe even millennia older than you, and you have your partner, an Archangel. There's adventure and humor and plenty of steam along the way. One of my favorite characters, the butler. And no, he didn't do it. At the end of the book, after Raphael kills Ura, a severely injured Elena, close to dying really, asks Raphael one of Angel Kind's most forbidden secret, how vampires are made. Like, exactly. Uh, Raphael says that angels secrete a substance that turns a mortal into an almost immortal, a vampire. However, not all humans can process this substance without dying violently. It's why there's testing. Before this, a great number of humans died while being mate. Then Raphael kisses Elena, transferring a substance that is supposed to make her a vampire. Cut to a year later in the refuge. The angels hide away where their children grow up. Elena wakes. However, she is not a vampire. She's an angel! As it turns out, the substance that Raphael transferred was Ambrosia, the mythical food of the gods. So it turned Elena not into a vampire, but an angel. No one can remember this happening before, so she's quite unique among creatures whose love of the unique can be fatal. Nalini Singh does it again. I mean, I'm serious about her talent for building these intricate and fascinating worlds. You know what this series reminds me of? Dominion. Yeah, that show um, based on the movie by Paul Bettany. Um, I love the premise, but uh, the execution fell a little flat. Anyway, I never really put vampires and angels together, much less angels making vampires. So if you have, please let me know and I'll read all of them. Singh introduces new mythologies um, into the angels and archangels, you know, topic. The hierarchy is there, like archangels uh, in the cadre of ten ruling 
vast lands and possessing different great and terrible powers. The angels who work under the archangels, the vampires uh, who serve the angels, and the humans who are, you know, sometimes left to fend for themselves or become food. I like how different the archangels are. I mean, they're all known to be ruthless and oftentimes cruel. Raphael is characterized as both, and it's in and is infamous for uh, leaving a tortured vampire who betrayed him and left said vampire in the middle of Times Square as a warning. The others have their own quirks, but I'll let you find out what they are when you read the series. I'll tell you their names and territories though, and forgive me when I mispronounce some of their names. I've never heard them said out loud, so I kind of have my own way of pronouncing them. Zhou Lijuan, the oldest and often called an ancient, and the only one of them who has a last name. She controls China. Tarisemba, the angel of North Africa. Elijah, archangel of South America and Raphael's closest ally. Favashi, archangel of Persia and for the first few books, the youngest and newest archangel. Michaela, archangel of Central Europe and former lover of the archangel of Russia, Uram. Neha, archangel of India. Astad, archangel of the Pacific Isles. And Titus, archangel of South Africa. You've already heard me mention Raphael, Archangel of North America. And then there's the seventh, Raphael's most trusted and loyal men. Dimitri, a vampire, the oldest and Raphael's best friend. Nasir, a vampire, and the second youngest. Galen, an angel and Raphael's weapons master, formerly from T Archangel Titus' court. Ilu, aka Bluebell, a blue-winged angel who grew up in Raphael's territory in the refuge. Differently spelled, by the way, it also means the largest part of the hip bone and the former name of the city of Troy. Eoden, see, I don't know how to pronounce this well. It's either Eoden or Yoen, but that's how it's spelled. Um, AKA Sparkle, an angel and Ilium's best friend, and Jason, Raphael's spy master, and possibly the only angel who did grow up in the refuge. And I feel really bad about this, but I completely forgot Venom, a vampire, and the youngest of the seven. And of course, there's Elena. She has had her own share of tragedy. I don't want to tell you the whole story because believe me, reading it is infinitely more satisfying. But I can tell you a little bit. So her father disowned her when she turned 18 because she joined the guild hunters. So you see, being hunter born, Elena didn't really have a choice. If a hunter born does not use her or his gifts, they go mad. She has an even more tragic that story, but you'll need to find out for yourself. Hunterborns are usually like the best trackers in the guild, stronger than most humans and immune to vampires' um, mind control. However, they are, they are highly sensitive to an older, more powerful vampire's scent lore. One consistently comic point in the series is that Dimitri, an older, powerful vampire and has a gift for scent lures, always baits Elena. So she, he provokes her so much that her only response really is to throw a dagger at him. First time she responded was throw a dagger at him straight across his throat. Well, straight through his throat and he just pulled it out and smiled like a pervert. I also love Elena's bond with the other guild hunters, especially with her best friend Sarah Haziz, who's the director of the guild. While the series essentially revolves around Elena and Raphael, the other characters get their moment in the sun too. This is where the big battle between Raphael and Lee Juan finally happens. At the end, when all hope seems lost, 777 legion angels come to their rescue and turn the tide. Even better, all of these angels are old and powerful and can regenerate fast. I mean, some angels have that ability, but not at that speed. The legion is sworn to Raphael and Elena, who they call Eclairi. So as far as I've read, that actually means warrior, but that's it. Neither Elena nor Raphael know, and the Legion don't seem to know how to define it. The book that follows it, Archangel's Prophecy, is a cliffhanger. I mean, Elena Spoilers. has to be alive. She has to be. The next book, Archangel's War, didn't come out until September 2019, and it's an absolute testament to me saying that I have a countdown on all of my devices for when, you know, a book of hers comes out. 13 books in, and I'm still all a quiver in anticipation. 
Um, and because I wrote this script in 2019, intending to do this video in 2019, but didn't, Archangel's War has been out for quite some time. I will be talking about it, but it is quite a gratifying read. There's a part in the book that's heartbreaking, but I think necessary, and that just gets to me. Honestly, I can talk more about this since I already read the latest one, which came out in November 2020, but I don't want to strain your patience. However, since this story comes uh, in the aftermath of the war, it's uh, more lighthearted than the previous ones, but uh, it's a story of an unlikely pairing that's Think of it as a mature romance, only since angels don't exactly age and are effectively immortal. The uh, maturity I'm talking about is more of status and years lived. I'm talking millennia. Uh, seriously, it's a great book and such a welcome relief after the heightened suspense and intensity of the previous ones. Um, not that I don't appreciate the heightened and suspense and the intensity of the novels. I I do, it's just that if you're like me and you get invested, very invested in the lives of um, fictional characters, it can get a little overwhelming. So this book was a respite, a much needed and much appreciated one. However, paranoid as I am, I feel like this is a love, but I'm ready for the oncoming storm. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for indulging me and catch you in the next episode where I talk about Deborah Harkness's All Souls trilogy where we start with the first book, A Discovery of Witches, which is now the basis of the first season of the TV series, also named A Discovery of Witches. Bye!